Well, welcome everybody to May's meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society and certainly it's been a strange couple of months with uh, the COVID-19 situation in uh, Australia. Um, this is, is the first of our meetings where we're doing it uh, without an audience and uh, pre-recorded and hopefully it won't be too much longer before we're able to get together even in small groups uh, at the Briars. As of the time of uh, this uh, recording, uh, at the May meeting, uh, access to the Briars is still uh, restricted as it's not an open uh, public space. Although uh, it is anticipated that uh, we may have access um, in early June, should uh, government regulations uh, permit it. Now I do um, recognise that we have uh, had some uh, new members since uh, we last held a meeting at the Briars and I do welcome uh, those members to uh, the Society and hopefully we'll get to meet you in person uh, in the near future. Um, in the meantime, uh, you're welcome to post a message to the Society's uh, email news group called uh, eScorpius and the address for that is e-scorpius, so S-C-O-R-P-I-U-S at groups.io and uh, that will get posted to everyone in the society. If you're only after uh, someone specific, such as our new members officer, uh, Nerida, uh, you can get her on welcome at empass.asn.au and she'll receive that email and hopefully answer any questions you have. Now, since we last met, uh, we haven't had, uh, unsurprisingly, any school nights or, or any public nights, and I suspect that the school nights that we already have booked uh, during this year are either going to not go ahead or be uh, severely uh, disrupted. Uh, in fact, uh, it's probably even a safe bet to say it's going to be quite some time before we have another uh, public viewing night possible. Uh, because as you can imagine, there's quite an issue with um, lots of people uh, touching and uh, viewing through uh, eyepieces at the telescope, and it just isn't practical to actually um, uh, sterilise and cleanse uh, those uh, each and every person that uh, comes through. Now, one uh, exciting uh, thing that uh, has happened in the uh, last uh, couple of months, uh, certainly before the full restrictions came into place, was that um, MPAS has taken on its first work experience student. We have had uh, approaches uh, occasionally uh, over the, uh, the past years, uh, but uh, up to that point, uh, we, we've never gone ahead with them for uh, various reasons. But um, this year we were approached um, to uh, give some experience at the observatory to um, a uh, member from, uh, sorry, a, uh, a student from Rosebud uh, Secondary uh, down at uh, Rosebud. And um, she was a year 10 student, uh, Marina Wilson. And you'll actually get to see her at uh, the end of this video, right at the end of the close of the meeting, where herself and her mother, who subsequently became uh, members, uh, give us uh, a little bit uh, of a uh, surprise to close the meeting. Now that uh, work experience went ahead uh, for one week, a year 10 work experience, and uh, we got an awful lot done in that time. Um, there were uh, health and safety posters produced and they're now actually sitting inside every building uh, on the site, uh, even the toilets, uh, absolutely everything and they show the evacuation routes, the location of the first aid boxes, the defibrillator and um, fire extinguishers uh, on the site and the preferred uh, evacuation and assembly routes and also the new uh, emergency evacuation marker that uh, is very close to our site. This is the one that if you ever you have to phone up the emergency number of triple zero, you quote that number and the emergency services immediately know where it is and uh, how to get there uh, fast. Uh, another thing that Marina did during this time was uh, she helped uh, check all the, uh, the seating in the observatory uh, auditorium for uh, stress cracks. And as you know, we've had uh, some issues with those over the years, um, possibly due to uh, successively heavier generations that uh, have gone on as uh, people have uh, gained more and more weight. And it could possibly be also that uh, they've um, not been of uh, the quality that was actually advertised uh, at the time. And it was good to see that uh, there were no new cracks actually on the uh, 90 or so chairs that uh, have uh, survived uh, so far. 
Um, she also did a, a wonderful job uh, cleaning all the eyepieces and all the barlows uh, from all the telescopes uh, anywhere on the site whatsoever. Uh, if we found it, uh, they were uh, cleaned. Uh, and at the same time, I also helped with um, cleaning all the telescopes and wiping them down with uh, alcohol, as well as all the surfaces that um, any people could uh, either accidentally or otherwise uh, touch. Now, as it turned out, we were very fortunate in that the week of the work experience was just before um, the uh, state government uh, decided to uh, heavily restrict uh, access and everyone was then uh, sort of confined to home at least for uh, work and other reasons. Uh, but uh, fortunately we were able to proceed uh, at the uh, Briars and the Observatory uh, because it's a small number of people uh, involved and the school actually uh, gave uh, permission as well to continue uh, regardless of the low level of restrictions that were in place uh, at that time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Marina measured um, three uh, of our meteorites, the uh, large um, nickel iron meteorite that we often show at uh, public nights and school nights, as well as also a uh, stony meteorite and one of the intermediate um, uh, stony metal uh, meteorites, palisite, uh, as well. And uh, using um, using various uh, pieces of inf instrumentation, uh, fairly detailed uh, scales, balances to weigh, as well as laboratory uh, measuring cylinders to uh, determine their volume very, very accurately, uh, and then uh, worked out the density uh, using uh, Archimedes uh, principle. And if you're not aware of what that is, that's uh, the old thing where uh, Archimedes um, leapt in the bath and then eventually yelled Eureka. You can look that up uh, online if you haven't heard that story yet. Uh, the, uh, the density is determined. We're actually very close to um, the, uh, the real values that um, for those type of meteorites online and certainly well within the range that uh, has been uh, experienced. Now, some more details of that will uh, appear in the next uh, newsletter. Scorpius when that uh, comes out uh, later this year and uh, so keep uh, an eye out for that. So as I said before you'll see Marina and her mother uh, Paula uh, at the uh, end of this uh, video uh, so um, do, uh, do keep watching. Um, so today's uh, meeting we're not going to have a live speaker we've had to actually move the scheduled speaker for May to later in the year and we yet to finalize the uh, the exact date uh, with them. They've um, already uh, agreed to uh, to move it a little bit later. So instead uh, we're going to follow a similar sort of format as we did uh, back in uh, March and, uh, and earlier months uh, with some uh, informative videos uh, of uh, various aspects of uh, astronomy and science and hopefully you'll find uh, some of those interesting. Uh, we've uh, been able to try and um, get them close to uh, what's dear to everyone's heart with um, social isolation and how to actually uh, survive it and how to actually s thrive in it. So a lot of these topics hopefully will be uh, uh, practical and uh, useful, if not uh, enlightening uh, post uh, facto. Uh, we'll begin with um, uh, the, uh, the sounds of isolation. Now isolation um, uh, we'll uh, begin by looking at the International Space Station, or the ISS, and looking at the learnings and advice that uh, various astronauts uh, provide uh, from their experience of uh, many months, and in some cases even years, uh, actually up uh, in orbit and obviously not able to come back down to Earth. So you should get some uh, pretty good uh, advice there on how to uh, thrive um, uh, without a lot of uh, social contact. Um, there's also an interesting uh, video on what the sky would sound like if you couldn't actually see it. And it was a, a project done by an astrophysicist uh, in the US to um, uh, assist a, um, a young lady who didn't have uh, particularly good vision. And so she was able to actually hear the, uh, the night sky and uh, that, that's an interesting one to watch as well. Following that will be uh, about the phenomenon of uh, synesthesia, and some of you may have um, already heard that term, where there's uh, uh, some uh, crosstalk in the brain between uh, the five senses that uh, uh, a few people have in the population, um, surprisingly high proportion actually, 
where, for example, you can uh, say uh, taste sounds or feel colours or smell textures or various other combinations of uh, the five senses as well. So your view in the world can become uh, quite uh, fascinating. Following that will be uh, Sky for the Month, uh, kindly put together by uh, Mark uh, Stevens, practising with this uh, new online format and uh, mastering it uh, brilliantly. Uh, then that will be followed by uh, Sky Murphy giving her um, uh, usual uh, interesting segment. Uh, this time it will be very much on uh, COVID and uh, COVID-19 uh, STEM. And if you recall, STEM stands for uh, Science, Technology, Engineering and uh, Maths. Uh, following that, we'll go on to um, a slightly longer public lecture that was given by the Royal Institute in London. And uh, this one is all going to be on the psychology and neuroscience of happiness. And this is given by um, three, uh, three people um, speaking on various aspects of uh, happiness. As I say, it's a public lecture. Um, I was fortunate enough to be invited to a public lecture at the Royal Institution uh, back in 1983 with uh, my wife, uh, Roz. And uh, at that particular time, um, they also had access in the same building in uh, Albemarle Street in uh, London to see um, Faraday's laboratory. And uh, Michael Faraday um, is, uh, is very well renowned for being one of the fathers together with uh, James Clark Maxwell um, of uh, electromagnetism. And the laboratory there was pretty much a shrine to as it was at uh, the time when uh, when Davy uh, died. So very, very interesting, very, very uh, small laboratory. But that um, lecture theatre that um, this public lecture on, on happiness uh, um, was given in, uh, it doesn't look uh, too daunting, but I can tell you when you're actually sitting uh, in the seats, they're an incredibly steep angle and uh, there are no guardrails to stop you falling forwards if uh, you uh, nod, nod off. And as it was, my wife and I actually had to go to that uh, public lecture straight from the airport after a 28-hour 20 flight, um, almost straight from uh, Melbourne uh, to uh, London. And uh, I'd have to say I don't remember a lot of that lecture. Unfortunately, I didn't fall forward. Um, following the, um, the talk about happiness, we'll be um, closing uh, the meeting. And as I said, that's uh, going to be a special surprise with uh, Marina and uh, Paula. And I certainly especially welcome them uh, to the society. And uh, hopefully we'll see a lot more uh, of you uh, in the future. In terms of when we might get access to the briars, it's very, very heavily dependent on when restrictions uh, may be relaxed by the state government. Uh, a likely scenario is that um, during June it may become relaxed enough that we can hold small gatherings at the uh, Briars. Whether or not that is um, uh, just outside uh, and possibly with uh, bring your own telescopes or um, uh, with telescopes that are shared with appropriate uh, distancing between people and uh, hand hygiene. Uh, and uh, with even more luck, we may be able to have then access to the buildings as well. Uh, currently, uh, outside meetings in uh, open public areas are allowable, but not uh, indoors as well, um, as we're not a household and we're not a uh, prescribed uh, workplace. Uh, but we will begin the meetings face-to-face uh, -face at the Briars again, uh, as soon as we can have uh, an audience of any size, uh, even if that means only 10 people. And we would obviously have to um, restrict uh, access uh, very, very closely with, uh, with that number if, uh, if it's in place. And hopefully we'll get up to 20, 30 and maybe ultimately, uh, say, 50 uh, in the near future. Now, National Science Week this year is going ahead. It's been officially um, sanctioned by the federal government to go ahead in August. So uh, clearly the federal government is confident enough that um, fairly normal activities will be in place by September. However, the organisers um, of National Science Week uh, in Australia uh, are um, playing on the safe side and are assuming that most, if not all, activities are going to be online in some form. So um, you'll be able to go to the website of um, National Science Week if you just uh, Google for that. Uh, when the events start coming up, there'll be uh, things like online talks as well as competitions and various other online things uh, at, uh, at that particular time. So uh, keep an eye out there. 
All right, well, without uh, further ado, we'll uh, begin the meeting now and uh, welcome new members, as I said before, to uh, the Society and uh, welcome back, uh, everybody. You're a long way from home you know, when you've left the planet. It's really important uh, not just to take care of all the technical stuff, but you, you got to take care of the people and the psychological side. And so we have uh, psych support people in Houston, and they realize that music is one of the things that's really fundamental to people. And so they were looking for a guitar uh, to put on the space station. They went to the, uh, the local guitar shop and they asked for a small body guitar because they wanted to be able to have an acoustic guitar but with a small, small box on it. And what they showed them at the Guitar Center was a Larry Bay parlor guitar. And so they bought two of them. Uh, one of them they keep in bond on the ground just so they have an example on Earth. And they launched the other one on the space shuttle up to the space station. And it's been up there uh, doing the math over 50,000 times around the world. It's, it's on, a, on a heck of an around the world tour. It's cool playing a guitar in space because it, uh, it floats in front of you, so you don't need a strap. You just float it and spin it in front of you, and 
Uh, one of the weirdest things is while you're playing to float around the room and bump into things while you're playing a guitar. It's, it's, you know, you don't normally have to hook your feet into something on earth in order to play a guitar. Also, if you're moving fast on the neck, you tend to miss, miss the frets when you first get to space because you're not just used to the weight of your arm or the, the mass of your arm, but on earth you're used to the weight of your arm as well. And so it helps you track where your hand's going to go. But without gravity, you tend to overshoot with your hand. And so, so you have to relearn how to fret if you're trying to fret in a hurry without gravity. But the sound is good, and as long as you can find a quiet place in the space station, someplace next to the window. Well, I think it'd be really good to record a bunch of songs on orbit, original music on orbit. Um, some of the earliest space-faring songs I'm going to write and play up there. So we have uh, the parlor guitar with an in-hole pickup, uh, plugged into a laptop with Cakewalk as a software, and then um, and then a couple uh, free mics, sure mics, that we can plug into a digital camera to get a digital recording. And I'll worry about mixing it when I get on the ground. I just need to record a bunch of stuff while I'm up here. I'd love to be able to play on orbit and, and have it down to a school and have a school play along with me, you know, that type of thing. But that uh, we're still working on how to do that. It's just it's such a unique link um, that music can bring and uh, a neat thing to take advantage of. So we're hoping to do it as much as we can. I love seeing where stuff comes from and, and how the machinery works and, and uh, you know what's behind the scenes and how it all how it all works and so uh, this is, I'm really happy that there's a Canadian guitar on the space station and it's nice to be in, in Vancouver in the factory in Canada where it's built. It's actually hard to play a guitar in space because every time you move your hand up the neck, the guitar just goes, takes off. There's nothing to hold it in place. I shot this entire video myself. You don't want to bother anybody else on the spaceship. They're all busy. And this is just sort of a fun project I did with my son and a couple musician friends on Earth. Some people wonder what took this picture. This is actually the space shuttle flying around the space station took this picture through the overhead windows. We called it the fly around. That's my bedroom on the spaceship right there. I would stick this sign up so people would be quiet while I was recording music. Ground control to Major Tom. It's so hard to get the lighting right here. Look close to my face. You can see two lights shining on my face so that it won't be uh, underexposed against the lightness of the earth in the background. If you float a camera in space, there's enough air moved around by the ventilators that the camera will turn very slowly, sort of like floating in the water. So I would take the camera and mount it on just a little flexible arm or Velcro it to the wall just to keep it straight. Ground control to Major Tom. It took about an hour and a half to make all these videos. Just one Saturday afternoon in the time on my schedule where it said time off, I just uh, took my vocal recording that I'd done and I just floated around the space station singing along with myself. I've always been a musician and I, I fronted bands for 25 years in Houston and I'd never played a Bowie tune before in my life before I got to orbit. To cover Bowie is arrogant. It's like, it's like covering Bach or something. I'm just gonna play the little ELO. You know, you just, you just don't do it. It's really hard to control the guitar and accurately play. And the producer that I was working with on the ground, he actually sent me a note saying, hey, your guitar playing's really messy up there. I'm like, you come up here and play guitar. This is a hard place to play. Your, uh, the guitar just won't sit still in your hands. This is ground control to Major Tom. All around the spaceship, there are foot restraints. There are little loops or little handrails so that you can momentarily stabilize yourself by hooking your toes underneath. But if you very carefully pop your toes out, then you'll just sort of float in the middle of the spaceship. And I thought while I was making this video, people should see that I'm truly on board a spaceship. These aren't special effects. And I'm floating in a most peculiar way. The internet chose this song. The internet is why I sang Space Oddity on the space station. I recorded an original tune on the space station that my brother and I wrote called uh, Jewel in the Night. And when people heard there was someone recording up on the space station, there was a big internet demand to do a cover of Oddity. 
So, so I did, and uh, it turned out nice. Bowie wrote Space Oddity when he was 19, turning 20. He wrote it as a result of the movie uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And because Apollo 9 and Apollo 10 had gone, and Apollo 11 was coming, and he realized, we're going to walk on the moon. And so he was fascinated by space flight and the loneliness of it, and he guessed what space flight would be like. But we changed the words for this song. We updated it. It's been 40 years. And he approved it. He loved this version of the song. He described it as the most poignant version of the song ever done. And I got to know him a little bit. And the fact that Bowie loved this version of the song, for me, that, that was the best part. It was his song, not mine. And it gave him a lot of pleasure in the last couple of years of his life. Bowie and, and all of the lawyers that work with him and his organization, they gave us permission to do it. And, and I'm glad they did. Planet Earth is blue and there's nothing left to do. NASA is tens of thousands of people. I think overall uh, they saw that it allowed people to see space flight for what it really is. It's people exploring the rest of the universe, living in an environment we've never been in before. We're up there just experiencing things like anybody else is. We're taking the culture we were raised with to a new place and adapting it. And that, I think, is a healthy, natural thing to do. And so uh, NASA, to a large degree, really loved it. And, and there's all sorts of stuff that NASA's doing now, using social media, using YouTube, using technology on board to try and help people understand space flight even better. On my first space flight, there were no digital cameras. So every picture was film. There was no internet. And in fact, real-time communication with the, with the ship was just by radio. It is really difficult to share a magnificent experience just by radio. Now, on board the spaceship, you can take a digital photograph and within minutes just hit send or write a few words about it and send it out on Twitter or whatever, and a billion people can see what you're doing, can, can maybe sense and, and share in the experience. And to me, that's great. Imagine if while Michelangelo was lying on his back painting the Sistine Chapel, if he'd had a webcam next to him, and if you could have asked him questions. We have no idea what Michelangelo was thinking. We only see the end result. I think seeing and understanding the process and the human side of it is a really important part of the creation of new things and the exploration of new places. I'm Commander Chris Hadfield. I really hope you enjoy learning how I made this uh, Space Oddity video. There's a lot more videos I made up there as well, talking about everything that happens on a spaceship. You should watch. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Hadfield. I've, I've spent a little time self-isolating on board a spaceship. How are you doing with self-isolation? You know, it's an extremely dangerous environment up on board the space station, and yet we find a way to thrive and be productive that far away from our normal lives. We do it through four different things. Number one, understand the actual risk. Don't just be afraid of things. Go to a credible source and find out what is truly the risk that you're facing right now. You, your, your family, your friends, the people that you care about. And then, what are you trying to accomplish? What are your objectives? You know, what's your mission for right now? Make that clear for this afternoon, for this week, for, for the next month. What do you want to get done? Then look at your constraints. Who's telling you what you need to do? What financial resources do you have? What are your obligations? But once you understand the risk and your mission, your sense of purpose and your obligations, then take action. Start doing things. They don't have to be the things that you always did before take care of family, start a new project, learn to play guitar, study another language, read a book, write, create. It's a chance to do something different that you've maybe not done before. And then repeat. And of course, if, uh, if you think you've been exposed to COVID, then, you know, if you've gotten closer than a couple arms length to people, then, then self-isolate. And, and if you have any symptoms, you know, a, a sore throat or, or a fever or a cough, then consult a physician. But there's never been a better time to self-isolate. So many people have access to the internet that, that you have the entire written work of everything, all the body of knowledge right there at your fingertips. So take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Take care of your friends. 
take care of your spaceship. And I wish everybody happy landings. Good morning. How are you folks doing today? We're doing okay, but yeah. tell us how to do this, because you're, yeah. you're way better at it than we are. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it's actually very doable, um, but it, it, it's very important to be able to interact well with the people you're, you're staying with, you're living with. And interesting, a lot of people are trying to work from home and trying to be parents from home and uh, have a family at home. And so it becomes very challenging, but that's just like what we did on board the International Space Station. Our space station crew became our family in orbit and we had to not only work with them all throughout the day, but we couldn't go home at night. We stayed there on board the station and had to interact as well. Uh, and so it became something that we did on a routine basis. And I think those interactions are very important. And we actually train our astronauts uh, to improve those skills because we want everyone to play well with others well, what, what are the skills? Uh, on board the space station. Because you don't get to pick your crew. Uh, you're just going to be up there <laughs> yes. and you have to make the best of whatever situation. You, yeah, and of, also, our lives depend on each other. So yeah. it's That's important. true. And it, it certainly feels like your life depends on the people in your household right now getting through the day as the hours roll by. So as people feel restless, just like you can't go to a bar when you're up there on the space station, we can't go to a bar down here on Earth anymore. So what do people do? What are those skills uh, that can be applied to everyday life to kind of get through this? Well, we call them expeditionary crew skills, but they include things like uh, teamwork and group living. And so recognizing that the team purpose is the most important. And COVID-19 gives us a very uh, higher, higher purpose, much like being in space does. Uh, because it, it, we are saving lives by quarantining. And so it is important to understand that bigger purpose and to embrace that purpose to give you reason and rationale for uh, continuing uh, to put up with the situation. And mm -hmm. then there's the, the actual interactions that you do with the people that you're living with. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you have to be able to communicate effectively for, foremost, that is the most important thing you have to be able to do. And so that we always have these ideas that we think we're communicating and we have to make sure that that's actually our intent that's but, hidden but Peggy, in our head is actually being communicated. Peggy, what if there are no others to play with other than yourself? Because I'm sitting here thinking I never get bored when I'm at home. Normally, I never get bored when I'm at home. But just knowing that I couldn't leave the house, all of a sudden my apartment seemed very boring. Did you ever get bored in space, number one, when you were there? And what advice do you have for people that don't have others to play with? play with? Uh, well, that's that's a really good point, Gail. I think that... Uh, First, did you ever the, get bored in space? On board the space... Did you ever get bored? Not really. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I figured. I, not really, because I, I always had the option to look out the window, and it was always an amazing view. <laughs> okay, I'll try <laughs> but, that. Uh, down here... <laughs> Down here, the other thing I always used to do is test lists. I would make, make, I would do the extra, extra work that I've been thinking about doing or that I wanted to organize. Um, think about things that, you know, having time, you know, so much of our lives these days is so busy and cluttered. And what are the, what are the things that you would do if you had more time? Is it to read? Is it, is it maybe to write poetry or do art? What is it that, that, you know, has been the thing that's in the back of your head that Clean I wanted closets. to try and do this and I've never had time. Clean yeah. closets. That's Peggy, what did you, I always did you ever, If you didn't get bored, did you ever get restless 665 days in a, in the space station? <laughs> Actually, I didn't. Uh, it, screen for it's this such kind of a, an amazing today. experience. I, I think being part of something that's bigger than me, being part of exploration was really really uh, something special to be a part of. So even if I was just cleaning the uh, fan filtration vents, it was still keeping the space station alive and being a part of exploration. Yeah, that's true. All right, Peggy Whitson, Peggy, thank you very much. Hey everyone, I'm Amy Shira Title, and welcome to a very special quarantine edition of The Vintage Space. And I mean that very literally.
It is currently March 17th, 2020, which means most of the United States is under a self-imposed quarantine on account of the coronavirus. So I thought it would be fun today to look at what happened when the Apollo astronauts were quarantined after their missions to the moon. The issue of Apollo and quarantine came up because no one could be sure that the astronauts wouldn't bring back some kind of sickness from the moon, something we shall call moon plague. The worst case scenario was that this moon plague would somehow infect the entire world, wiping out all of humanity right after NASA achieved the amazing goal of landing men on the moon. To avoid such a horrific end to the Apollo program, NASA worked with the Interagency Committee on Bat Contamination to figure out a way to protect not only humanity, but also all plant and animal life from some potential lunar disease. The joint agency's goals were threefold to protect the public's health, agriculture, and other living resources, to protect the integrity of the lunar samples and the science experiments, and to ensure that the operational aspects of the program were least compromised. To achieve these goals, NASA and the ICBC created a three-stage quarantine program that would begin at the moment the astronauts sealed the hatch after their last moonwalk, and would last a full 21 days. But it wasn't just about containing possible contamination on the way back from the moon or returning from the moon. If the crew did get sick after their mission, how could doctors be sure that it was the moon plague and not just a common Earth cold? To take that potential out of the equation, the astronauts were quarantined before the flight. Most germs and viruses we have on Earth have about a three-week incubation period, which means it takes three weeks from you being exposed to something to start showing signs of having an illness. So the crew was quarantined before the flight such that anything that happened after the mission could not be chalked up to some earthly virus. This is actually something NASA still does today, though the rationale is to prevent astronauts getting sick in space. The last thing you want when you don't have gravity is a head cold, because you know what's not gonna drain without gravity? Sinuses. So all Apollo astronauts launched to the moon happy and healthy. Once they landed on the moon and closed the hatch after their final EVA, that's when quarantine began. The first stage of quarantine was quarantining the crew and all of their collected samples during the return to Earth. That's the transfer to Earth as well as re-entry and splashdown. When we're talking about quarantine, that's a pretty easy phase. There was nothing up there for them to interact with, so it was pretty simple to just keep everything sealed up and know that nothing was going to happen. Once the mission splashed down, however, things got a little more complicated. NASA did consider keeping the astronauts sealed inside the spacecraft during recovery, so they would still be inside the capsule when it was lifted out of the water and placed on the deck of the recovery carrier. The idea being you put the entire spacecraft in a controlled environment, and that means that there's no contaminants escaping when the astronauts get out. But this was deemed unsafe, because the crew would be sitting baking in the metal capsule for hours. They would need to have some specialized air conditioning system, and it was too much for the suits to handle on its own. So it was easier to have them egress the capsule when it was in the water. Thus, the first stage of recovery opened the largest problem in the question of quarantine. The Navy divers that assisted in egress were wearing protective garments, but they had to open the capsule to get the crew, which means it was exposed to the air and the water for a brief period of time. The hatch was opened and the divers threw in biological isolation garments, head-to-toe garments that included a mask that would keep all of the astronauts' germs inside. Once they were in these specialized garments, they were airlifted up into the helicopter that then landed on the recovery carrier, and then they transferred into the mobile quarantine facility. And by transferred, I mean walked. The MQF was a specially designed Airstream trailer that had sleeping facilities, bathroom, kitchen, and a lounge area. But it wasn't just for the crew. Technicians had to be inside as well to help the crew transfer all of the samples from the spacecraft into the MQF. They did that with a specially pressurized little foldable tunnel thing. The MQF was not only totally self-contained, it was also movable. The crew stayed inside when it was loaded into a transport aircraft and then flown to Ellis Air Force Base. From there, it was loaded onto a flatbed truck and driven to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center. The LRL was a state-of-the-art quarantine facility that not only housed the crew, the spacecraft, and their rocks from the surface, it was actually staffed. Staff members had to pass through an airlock and shower of ultraviolet light that would kill exposed bacteria and microbes before they went into the LRL. 
Then they had to don clean clothes that hadn't been outside. Leaving the LRL meant taking a shower and disinfecting. Of course, all the staff in the LRL had to not only be healthy, pregnant women weren't allowed to work there either. But it was necessary to have staff, otherwise, who would feed the crew? And how would the doctors perform the physical exams on the crew to make sure they weren't sick? The LRL also included administrative offices. The crew could actually talk to the media as well as NASA brass through big windows, so they could have meetings and mission debriefings without exposing anybody to the potential moon plague they were carrying. The whole quarantine lasted a total of three weeks, at the end of which the Apollo 11 astronauts showed absolutely no signs of illness, so they were free to go. The same thing happened for the crew of Apollo 12, only they didn't have to don the full isolation garments when they were recovered from the ocean. Instead, they just put on masks. In the spring of 1970, the Interagency Committee on Back Contamination determined that such quarantine measures were not actually necessary. Since none of the crew exhibited any illnesses, and the surface of the moon had been untouched for billions of years, they figured that there was nothing that the crew was going to bring back that could affect humanity. Some quarantine measures were kept in place for the crew of Apollo 14 because this mission took a deep core sample, and there was some question that a core sample might have material on it that was not present on the surface rocks that the earlier missions had collected. Of course, Apollo 13 did not need to go through quarantine because they did not land on the moon. Apollo 14 was ultimately the last mission to spend significant time in quarantine, though all lunar samples were put through the same strict quarantine measures as the original samples from Apollo 11. This was thought to be the best way of preserving their integrity. Do make sure that your moon rocks are properly quarantined. Do social distance. Consider hanging out through a window. Do play with your moon rocks like they're boobies, as long as you're wearing gloves. Thanks, Pete Conrad. Do play ukulele, ideally if you're good at it. Do drink a refreshing Coca-Cola while your buddy plays with pieces of hardware. Do eat cake. Neil Armstrong celebrated his 39th birthday in quarantine with a decent-sized crowd of medics and technicians. Do be sure to eat. Nutrition is important all the time. You've been at it for yeah. a good three minutes. Oh right? my gosh, it feels like an eternity. <laughs> Sending people to space isn't just about hardware and mechanics. It's also about biology. Your body changes a whole lot in microgravity, and you can be exposed to some harmful elements. So I'm headed to NASA to learn how astronauts keep their bodies healthy during missions in space. So a big part of an astronaut's day is just working out. Here on Earth, we have gravity to work against, so just standing works our bones and our muscles, but in zero gravity, you don't have that, so you risk weakening your muscles and bones. But we're here at the Countermeasures Training Facility, right. and your job is to stop that from happening. Well, we, we try to minimize it as much as possible, and uh, the way we do that is we have them work out six out of seven days a week for two and a half hours per day. Dang, that is, <laughs> that's, a, that's a schedule I should be adhering to here on Earth. We all should, but <laughs> that time is spent uh, working out for roughly an hour, uh, lifting weights on that machine. They'll run for basically another 45 minutes to an hour, or they'll hop on the bike and exercise that way. Now I'm going to get a taste of what it's like to work out like an astronaut. You are. So I feel like I might need to change. You better go get dressed out. Okay. Now, these aren't your average machines at the gym. They're specifically designed for microgravity. If we took a weight set up to the station, it wouldn't weigh anything. It'd just be mass floating around getting in the way, so we used basically differential pressure. You have two evacuated cylinders mm -hmm. that um, you can see up there. Inside each cylinder is a piston, so that would be sort of synonymous with a syringe. If you were to close the top of a syringe, it creates a vacuum that's hard to pull against. The canisters do basically the same thing, creating a simulated weight that astronauts can lift in space. So you're pulling against that, yes. that force? Yes. Gotcha. When you're ready, stand up nice and tall. You have the weight. And then I can and go. You're going to squat down. There you go. I've been traveling, so I haven't been working out in a while. So please bear with me. Very good. Step <laughs> forward. 
Keep bringing your shoulders and chest forward, look for the orange. Does it feel different when it's on the station because we are in a gravity environment? The load will feel the same, however the machine will move with you. Give me a break here, weightlifting really isn't my thing. So we moved on to something that's more my beat, cardio. Now the trick about running on a treadmill in space is that you actually have to be connected to the treadmill and loaded down to the treadmill surface. Right. Or else you just float away and you wouldn't be running very long. Right. So what we have... Is a harness. It's a harness. How do I look? The next step is to get you on this treadmill and connected to what we call bungees. These are three big pieces of surgical tubing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to connect you at the hip. It's definitely a bit odd to run while attached at the hip. Your body wants to move fast, but you feel weighed down. I feel like my body is trying to be torn in two. Okay. <laughs> in space, of course, it's the only way to stay on the treadmill and actually get a workout. Here's a good question. Yep. Where does the sweat go? The in sweat, sweat, yeah. Does yeah. it float off and, and, and it, annoy it, the other astronauts? At, at first, it'll just stick to your face in big balls, big globs of sweat. Okay. Because the surface tension. Okay. Eventually, that ball of sweat will grow and get larger, and if you like, did that, just going to fly and then it's going to get captured by the ventilation system. Oh, okay. Well, it'll get recycled and <laughs> right. it's tomorrow's coffee, so. <laughs> Wonderful. I definitely got a workout in by testing another mode on the treadmill and even a bike. They like to give the astronauts options as working out is a consistent part of their daily routine. But it's not just bones and muscles that change in space. Astronauts also experience vision disorders, cardiovascular issues, and balance problems. And then there are health hazards linked with just being outside the safety of Earth's atmosphere, like space radiation. Radiation is concerning because it can pierce through materials, including skin, and cause damage. There are a few different sources of space radiation. You've got energetic particles that are periodically ejected from the sun, and then you have deep space cosmic rays from exploding stars outside our solar system. Here on Earth, we're protected from a good chunk of space radiation thanks to our planet's magnetic field and atmosphere. These two things act like barriers around Earth, deflecting a lot of particles that head our way. Astronauts live outside most of our protective atmosphere, though, so they get more exposure on the job. And if they were to go deeper into space, their exposure would be even higher. NASA has a radiation laboratory set up in New York. The scientists use a particle accelerator to study the effects of space radiation on DNA and cells. Instead of bringing the samples up to the radiation, we bring the radiation down to the samples. You take ions and you accelerate them around in a ring faster and faster until the electrons start to strip off, so you're left with a residual positive charge. And those are the type of ions that are present in the space radiation environment. You can generate them on the ground. So the beam actually comes from up this tunnel over here, along the rails in there that you might be able to see. And then this essentially becomes a target area where samples can be brought in and placed uh, on the beam line so that uh, they can be exposed in a, in a sequential, systematic kind of a fashion. Scientists are then able to test how different levels of radiation may affect astronauts. They are monitored carefully to assess what level of radiation they've exposed in their life. That's not anything different than, say, a nuclear plant worker or a coal miner or something who is encountering some radioactive material. Just and another blue-collar job, in, no problem. In, in, astronauts have dosimeters, like we actually have here at the particle accelerator, that will measure approximately what dose your body has received. That's important because too much radiation can have some nasty effects. There are three main areas that are of concern to human beings in space travel, and one of them is effects on the central nervous system. And so another major one is the effects on other organs as a whole. And the third major area of interest, which is probably the primary one, is cancer. Mitigating these effects of radiation is a top priority for NASA. And one tool they're using to reduce damage is spacecraft shielding. Different materials like aluminum and specialized plastics can block from one quarter to one third of radiation in space. If you can use a more effective type of shielding material, you at least reduce the amount that the person would absorb and enough of it is blocked such that it doesn't really produce any kind of significant biological effects. Completely preventing exposure is probably not going to happen, but with more research, better shielding can be developed that may make trips into deep space possible. Until then, I'll keep working on my fitness, just in case, you know, NASA wants to send me to orbit. <laughs> and it's the three mile an hour walk, Lauren, so you can just kind of relax. I mean, and walk. relax is a relative term here. <laughs>
Walking has never been so difficult before. <laughs> You might think you'd have to be on some kind of psychoactive street drug to see music or taste the feeling of the wind in your hair. Not the case. You could instead have synesthesia, a neurological condition in which two senses are perceived simultaneously. Synesthesia is Greek for joined perception, and it can involve mixing any of our senses, sometimes even three or more of them at once, although that's more rare. Researchers have found that synesthesia is often inherited, though members of a family will sometimes have different types. Scientists at Baylor University think that they've identified a region of DNA on chromosome 16 as the culprit, at least for the most common form, called colored sequence synesthesia. This is when people perceive letters or numbers or words or days of the week, or whatever, as being inherently colored. Like the letter A is red and the number four is brown. And you might be thinking, See, yeah, that person probably just had a red A magnet on their refrigerator when they were a little kid, so they think of A's as being red. But most studies suggest that there's something funny going on with the synesthete spray. Although there's no established way to diagnose synesthesia, true synesthetes have a few things in common. One, their mixed perception of senses is involuntary. It happens without them thinking about it. Two, their condition is experienced rather than imagined. Like if I asked what color is a triangle, a synesthete would see a color, say yellow, immediately, and they wouldn't have to think about it before their brain made the association. Three, the sensory mix-up is durable, meaning that the associations are always the same. Bacon can't taste like one day and Beethoven the next. Four, often the secondary perception of a thing will be more memorable than the primary one. So if a synesthete always associates the name Dave with the color purple, they'll usually remember the purple first, which tells them that it's Dave. And finally, number five, the perceptions may be really emotional. Like, oh my god, this Elton John song playing in the TJ Maxx smells like gasoline! Get me out of here! Now of course the question is, what are these people's brains up to? One idea is that it might be a defect in the neural structure. Scientists theorize that we're born with our senses sort of all tangled up, and then over time, our brains shut down the neural bridges between our senses, so we experience them separately. But synesthetes might not be properly shutting down those bridges, making their lives a little bit trippier than everybody else's. Another theory suggests that synesthesia is caused by neurochemistry. Our neurons communicate with each other through chemicals called neurotransmitters. So it could be that synesthetes have neurotransmitters meant for one part of the brain, way over in a different part, or they could lack chemicals called inhibitors that help keep neurotransmitters in check. This would explain why a lot of synesthetes have different sensory experiences when they're really tired or really hungry, or why it happens to people on hallucinogenic drugs. And of course, because our brains are complicated places, it could also be a combination of all of these things. For now, synesthesia is yet another thing that we don't completely understand about the delicious, amazing things that are our brain. Imagine a world in which you see numbers and letters as colored, even though they're printed in black. In which music or voices trigger a swirl of moving colored shapes. In which words and names fill your mouth with unusual flavors. Jail tastes like cold, hard bacon, while Derek tastes like earwax. Welcome to Synesthesia, the neurological phenomenon that couples two or more senses in 4% of the population. A synesthete might not only hear my voice, but also see it, taste it, or feel it as a physical touch. Sharing the same root with anesthesia, meaning no sensation, synesthesia means joint sensation. Having one type, such as colored hearing, gives you a 50% chance of having a second, third, or fourth type. One in 90 among us experience graphemes, the written elements of language like letters, numerals, and punctuation marks, as saturated with color. Some even have gender or personality. For Gail, three is athletic and sporty. Nine is a vain, elitist girl. By contrast, the sound units of language, or phonemes, trigger synesthetic tastes. For James, college tastes like sausage, as does message in similar words with the idge ending. Synesthesia is a trait, like having blue eyes, rather than a disorder, because there's nothing wrong. In fact, all the extra hooks endow synesthetes with superior memories. For example, a girl runs into someone she met long ago. Let's see, she had a green name. Deezer Green, Deborah, Darby, Dorothy, Denise. Yes, her name is Denise. Once established in childhood, pairings remain fixed for life. 
Synesthetes inherit a biological propensity for hyperconnecting brain neurons, but then must be exposed to cultural artifacts such as calendars, food names, and alphabets. The amazing thing is that a single nucleotide change in the sequence of one's DNA alters perception. In this way, synesthesia provides a path to understanding subjective differences, how two people can see the same thing differently. Take Sean, who prefers blue-tasting foods such as milk, oranges, and spinach. The gene heightens normally occurring connections between the taste area in his frontal lobe and the color area further back. But suppose in someone else that the gene acted in non-sensory areas. You'd then have the ability to link seemingly unrelated things, which is the definition of metaphor, seeing the similar in the dissimilar. Not surprisingly, synesthesia is more common in artists who excel at making metaphors, like novelist Vladimir Nabokov, painter David Hockney, and composers Billy Joel and Lady Gaga. But why do the rest of us non-synesthetes understand metaphors like sharp cheese or sweet person? It so happens that sight, sound, and movement already map to one another so closely that even bad ventriloquists convince us that the dummy is talking. Movies, likewise, convince us that the sound is coming from the actors' mouths rather than surrounding speakers. So, inwardly, we're all synesthetes, outwardly unaware of the perceptual couplings happening all the time. Cross-talk in the brain is the rule, not the exception. And that sounds like a sweet deal to me. My name is Caitlin Hova. I'm a software engineer, neuroscientist, and a musician. I also have synesthesia. Synesthesia is a blending of the senses. One in 23 people have a form of it. For me, when I hear specific musical notes, I see specific colors. And these colors are much brighter at night. What you're seeing in front of me is a lot like what I see when I hear this music. Each one of these colored lights corresponds to a particular note. And the colors are always the same. I've seen these colors my whole life, but I didn't know that was unusual until I was 21 years old. It was the final music theory course for my music major. And at the end of the class, my professor mentioned that some people can physically see sounds as colors. And to me, I thought, duh. And everyone in the classroom turned to look at me. We did tests where they played notes on the piano and I told them what color it was. And at that point, I knew I had synesthesia. Synesthesia can manifest itself in so many different ways. It can blend together vision, taste, smell, sound. It can be almost anything. But for me, it's always been about the colors and the music. Synesthesia makes my music a very visual experience. When I'm listening to a piece, it's sort of like watching a video. And I can listen to it over and over again and focus on different colors and patterns each time. Now, if you turn to face the city, you can really step into my shoes and see what I see.
not sure what I would do if my synesthesia went away, but I'm sure that the world would look a lot different. Hi all, Mark Stevens uh, presenting Sky for the month, uh, May 2020, uh, from personal lockdown. The, uh, what you will find is that the presentation will essentially uh, be the same PowerPoint you get at Astro meetings each month. However, you'll have to do a little bit of work yourself uh, to get uh, the full benefits from it. As you uh, scroll through the slides, you will note a speaker symbol in the center of the slide. If you hover your cursor over that speaker and then press the left hand arrow, you will be regaled with the wonderful dulcet tones of myself as I explain the contents or point out various contents of each slide. I do apologize for my voice. I have a great voice for silent movies. So without further ado, uh, I would ask you to proceed to the next slide and hopefully you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. First up, we have the highlights for May, June 2020, although I won't focus too strongly on uh, June, uh, given most of that will come uh, next month, hopefully a little bit quicker and a little bit smoother than this one. Uh, our first quarter moon uh, would have occurred or did occur on the 1st of the 5th, so uh, I recognise it has passed, and Mercury is in superior conjunction uh, on the 5th, which essentially means it's on the other side of the sun, and uh, not in a very good viewable position. Uh, a point of note for uh, the enthusiastic ones there is Comet 88P Howl, being 0.2 degrees south of NGC 4753, which is a galaxy in Virgo. The moon is at perigee, which means it's closest to Earth on the 6th of the 5th, and the full moon is on the 7th of the 5th. We have Pluto, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, and those are the degrees there, uh, north of the Moon on the 12th and 13th of the 5th. So in relatively close proximity to each other. You may be able to use Jupiter and Saturn to uh, spot the dot that is Pluto, but given it's probably not much uh, brighter than a, or appears much brighter than a star, won't all be all that easy to see. Uh, on the 14th, Comet Hale is 0.7 degrees south of NGC 4666. And then we have our last quarter moon on the 15th uh, of the 5th. The, uh, obviously from the next couple, the, the uh, various planets are, are within a few degrees or relatively few degrees of the moon, which uh, particularly with things like Neptune and Uranus won't uh, make them all that easy to observe. On the 18th of the 5th, the moon is at Apogee, which means it is at its furthest point from Earth during its orbit. New Moon occurs on the 23rd of the 5th, so there uh, should be some good viewing around that time uh, without having the light pollution of the Moon. And as you can see, uh, in June, most of what uh, is going to happen will be uh, Jupiter, Saturn um, and Mars and Pluto, all in relative close proximity, and uh, the Moon uh, once again being fairly uh, prominent in, in terms of its closeness to each of the planets. So moving right along, uh, we have a picture here of the sky looking south. Now I urge you to ignore uh, Jupiter and Saturn in this uh, slide. This was uh, actually last year's and they have moved from there. Uh, but it's the, the best star chart I have that is suitable for a PowerPoint. So don't expect to see the planets uh, where they are. And the same for the next slide. It, items of interest in this slide, or the, the stars, etc., pretty well stay where they are from year to year. Uh, but objects of interest in this slide are the Tarantula Nebula. Now, this is a nebula that is actually in the Lower Magellanic Cloud. It is uh, down towards the, the bottom right-hand side of, uh, of the star chart. Uh, just over from that towards the left, you'll see 47 Tacane. Uh, this is a globular cluster, which quite often is a, a good alternative to Omega Centauri. 
However, uh, Omega Centauri, which is uh, supposed to be the best cluster in the sky or visible cluster in the sky, uh, is quite high in the sky and therefore very easily observed up there in Centaurus, uh, centre up towards the top, uh, just above the Southern Cross. Uh, you'll see uh, with the Southern Cross, you have the jewel box next to it, uh, the Colsac Nebula, not always easy to pick out uh, in our light polluted skies, but if you're ever out in the desert somewhere, you can see this hazy dark patch uh, just in the corner of Crux there, and that's the Colsac Nebula. And the reason it is uh, so dark is it doesn't have any stars illuminating it from within. Uh, just to uh, the west of that, you have Eta Carina uh, Nebula, quite a spectacular object, uh, a, a good alternative to uh, the Orion Nebula. Uh, tends to be a bit higher in the sky when Orion is set, uh, so at least you've got a nebula to look at if that's uh, that's your thing. Uh, up to the right, right hand side there, we do have the ghost of Jupiter. Uh, the interesting thing with the ghost of Jupiter is it, it looks very much like Jupiter, but it's an actual fact, a, a planetary nebula, uh, and is quite a reasonably easy object to uh, to get. Moving over to the left, uh, we have the tail of Scorpio. Uh, containing the cat's eyes uh, M7. These are all open clusters uh, in the tail of Scorpio and they're, they're quite good. Uh, another one there, Antares, is uh, another red giant. Some days probably going to supernova, but uh, apparently not showing any real signs of it yet. And then we have the Lagoon Nebula and the Wild Duck Cluster. As to the May night sky looking north, and once again I do point out to ignore Jupiter and Saturn there, though that's not where they are at the moment, this was uh, last year's. We uh, note a, a few things uh, particularly notable, uh, and that is the Virgo cluster, which you'll see probably just uh, lower left of centre, uh, a hazy patch, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, this uh, later on, but it is a, a large cluster of galaxies and uh, could be a very uh, worthwhile uh, object over the course of the night or course of the month. Um, essentially over to the right we still have some of the higher objects uh, such as the Lagoon Nebula and uh, the Cat's Eyes, the uh, tail of uh, Scorpio in general. As pointed out in the previous slides, we have an area uh, in space in uh, Virgo and Coma Berisis in, in which there is a significant number of galaxies uh, within the field of view. Now these galaxies are known collectively as the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. And if you were to give the address of the solar system, this would be our uh, galaxy cluster within the universe. Not that these galaxies are all that close to us. Uh, the distances are, are truly astronomical and, uh, and pun intended. The uh, reason they refer to it as a supercluster is as the universe has been found to consist of bunches of galaxies in relative close formation. And by relative, you hopefully understand what I mean in astronomical terms. Anyway, Probably an interesting part of the sky to have a look at uh, this month, uh, up there in Coma Benicis and Virgo, and uh, just see how many of these galaxies uh, appear. Probably uh, better with astrophotography, but in uh, bigger telescopes, you might actually be able to pick some of them out. So what are the planets up to this month? Well, Mercury moves through its superior conjunction, uh, which essentially means it is on the other side of the Sun. Uh, it's in conjunction with the Sun, but the other side. Uh, on Tuesday the 5th, and uh, makes it rather difficult to view. Uh, Venus, uh, having moved through its maximum elongation on the 25th of March, continues to move to, between Earth and Sun, uh, thus getting closer to us and becoming a little bit brighter. However, as it moves uh, into or towards its inferior conjunction, it really has its back to us. It's unlit side, and so it appears very much as a crescent, uh, although a rather large one uh, relative to other planets. Uh, as for Earth, caught a serious illness at the moment, 
and uh, advice to all interstellar travellers is to give it a miss this year. As for the outer planets, uh, Mars is still a morning object with a 1am rise uh, in Sagittarius, uh, where it will be joined over the course of the month by Jupiter, Saturn and uh, Pluto is already there. Uh, it should reach opposition in October and hopefully without the sandstorms of 2018. Jupiter is moving towards Sagittarius. It rises a little later than Mars and so uh, once again also a morning object. And it is being joined by Saturn, so it might be worth staying up for, although uh, as the year progresses, uh, these objects will move into the uh, evening sky. Uh, as said, Saturn appears in the morning skies in Sagittarius with Jupiter uh, over the course of the month, but uh, they should start to move into the pre-midnight sky. Uranus can be found in Aries, uh, nothing spectacular there. It can be found in Aries up until 2024, so no real rush. Uh, it has moved through its conjunction with the sun in April, and so it should be viewable uh, to the more enthusiastic uh, of you in the uh, early morning sky. And Neptune can be found in Aquarius, low on the western horizon uh, of an evening. Although I would suggest that evening twilight will probably make it very difficult to view uh, with any real, uh, not that it shows a lot of detail anyway. Uh, it does approach its conjunction later this month. As for the appearance of the planets uh, this month, Mercury being in superior conjunction pretty much has its face towards us, although uh, relatively close to the sun. So uh, even though we see a lot of its face, it's going to be perhaps too close to the sun to really view. Venus, on the other hand, has passed through maximum elongation and is moving into inferior conjunction. As such, we tend to see more of the back of it, which thus means we see it as a crescent. Uh, with the side towards the sun uh, only very uh, narrowly lit and uh, however it does as it gets closer to us it does increase in uh, relative diameter. Mars uh, obviously getting bigger as uh, we actually move closer to it uh, ready for its uh, opposition in October. Saturn still has its rings tilted towards us uh, and although you'll need to uh, get up in the morning or early early morning to uh, observe it. Uh, it it's still uh, pretty spectacular. Uh, Jupiter is also a morning object, uh, always uh, spectacular in my opinion. And Uranus and Neptune, uh, kind of little indistinct blue, green and bluey dots. And Pluto, it's one of those stars out there. Other, for the, uh, other stuff for the month uh, includes three comets actually, although uh, there were only two mentioned in uh, Astronomy 2020 book. So I'll put them up here and uh, I will briefly talk about the other one. Uh, the first one is Comet 88P HAL. Uh, it opens the month at 11th magnitude in Virgo uh, and it'll be there pretty well through May. Uh, it should be visible during the night just after midnight. So uh, it looks to be a month that uh, the stop-ups will, uh, will actually have plenty to look at. Uh, towards the end of the month, it'll become 10th magnitude or is expected to become 10th uh, magnitude. And from the 13th of May till the 8th of June, it'll be within one degree of Gamma Virginis. Uh, that's Virgo. The other one is Comet 249P Linear. Uh, it may brighten to 12th magnitude during May, and you can expect to see it in the northwest evening sky at the end of twilight on the border of Cancer and Gemini. And last of all, we uh, better mention Comet Swan, uh, which uh, I think it's obviously only just been found fairly recently. Uh, I know Greg Walton has uh, taken a couple of shots of it, and uh, put it on the uh, on the website so worth having a look at and a look for now as for all our dwarf planets and smaller solar system bodies uh, as mentioned earlier the dwarf planet Pluto is in Sagittarius with Jupiter Saturn and uh, Mars relatively close to it 
It uh, rises around 9 p.m. mid-month in the eastern evening sky. Now, of the minor planets, uh, you have five minor planets. Now, by minor planets, I'm meaning asteroid objects and uh, Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, most of them this month are in uh, Libra or Scorpius. Fairly low magnitude, so uh, probably an object for the more enthusiastic to uh, have a look for. And to finish up this month, I'll invite you to join Stevo's Solar System Tour. It's going to be a quick and simple look at the solar system of which Earth is a part and give you a bit of an idea of uh, what's out there uh, and fairly local to look at. Now, by local, uh, it, it's all relative. Some of the distances we'll look at are quite considerable in themselves, but in universal terms, they're not that far. Uh, start this month with a look at uh, the centre of the solar system, the uh, object that powers the solar system, if you like, the sun. Our sun is a G-type main sequence star known as the yellow dwarf. By main sequence, it basically means it is in the normal part of its uh, lifespan, no longer a protostar and not yet in the process of uh, becoming extinct. It's 4.6 billion years old and it is expected to last for about 10 billion years. So it's about halfway through its life uh, lifespan. Uh, we are 150 million kilometres uh, from the sun. And I've put there that it's one astronomical unit from Earth. Uh, astronomical unit being defined as the average distance from Earth to the sun. And the reason I've used it also is uh, it helps to give you a bit of a, a, a perspective on the distance of other objects that your mind can actually get its head around, if you like. Uh, we, our sun, our solar system, is 27,200 light years from the galactic core, so we're about halfway from the core to the edge of the galaxy. Consists of about 73% hydrogen, 25% helium, and traces of oxygen, carbon, neon, and iron. And at light speed, it takes light 8 minutes and 16 seconds to get to us. As I said, going to be very quick and simple. And that concludes Sky for the Month for May 2020 in a slightly unusual uh, format. And I uh, hope everyone's locked down and being safe uh, and getting through this uh, difficult time. Certainly looking forward to getting back to the briars myself, so I think most of you probably feel the same. Tonight's information uh, was provided by the Astronomy 2020 book by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. Uh, those of you having that publication, I certainly encourage you to read it. Uh, there is more information in there than, than I can present in a, a PowerPoint. Once again, thank you for listening, and uh, hopefully I'll be back next month with a slightly smoother presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, in my last talk on waves, light and blue, I showed some examples of what happened to a system when there's a sudden input as a level change or a thump. Suddenly COVID-19 happened. And look at what happened to the world. Here also showing the US and Australia. Here is from my last talk. Showing possible responses of a simplified system as known in engineering as a second-order system. Something like a spacecraft or like us is a system. When there's a sudden input as a step level up, what's the response? At the top, it overshoots 
Then, like elasticity or car steering, bounces the other way. So we see an oscillation. In the other two examples, it's less elastic and there's more damping. You can design or adjust the system to get the preferred response. If under control, it can settle to a new level. If not, it can run away. On the right, if the sudden input is a short impulse that later does not continue, the output for each case may settle back down to a previous level. The same slide as before. These are beautiful classic responses. Of course, it's oversimplified and several factors and unknowns are at play. Have a look at Australia first on the right. Thump, the system, that's us, was made not to agitate and not to create further input. The response dies down. The US top left, most beautiful as graphs go. The ringing oscillation, the slow trend that may level off, but not yet down near zero. There may be a continued input. And yes, stirring the system about can cause another thump or a prolonged input. The whole world's response, bottom left, is trending up again at the moment. In an engineering design, a feedback loop makes the adjustment automatic. Feedback can be effective or it can run away. We are familiar with the audio feedback squeal where it is a runaway. So, COVID-19 too. Its control can be effective or it can run away. And COVID-19 is self-generating an additional input as we infect each other. Basic system engineering principles have been adopted to apply to economic and social responses. Modeling of a system is important. Control and adjustments are important. However, with chaotic humans and many facets of COVID-19, some really unknown, this is much worse than such examples as weather observations and forecast. In any case, knowledge leads to a better outcome. Lack of knowledge adds chaotic factors. A system can become unmanageable. So I'd say, STEM knowledge is for all of us, not just informal education. Let's STEM up. I see math as beautiful. Engineering is awesome. And science 
is about truth, verifiable truth. Keep well, everyone. Thank you so much, Vince. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've just flown in from Copenhagen, as it happened, talking about happiness. Um, but I thought the best place to start, really, is to think about joy, to think about pleasure, and maybe something like this. It just goes on and on. Why are they so happy? Why does it make you feel so good? <laughs> Imagine what it's like when they're crying. <laughs> so this, of course, is great for Monday mornings, or days when it rains as much <laughs> as it does today. Um, four laughing babies on YouTube will get you that fix. Um, at the same time, it's also very clear, I think, that we are living in a time of, a, of great change. And it's also very clear that there is something tragic about this consciousness that some of us are endowed with, and maybe not the president of the US, but most of us. Um, <laughs> Because, of course, as I, this quote I put up for you is from a, a very interesting book, which is a collaboration between the Nobel Prize winning writer John Steinbeck and a field biologist called Ed Ricketts, and it's called Log from the Sea of Cortez. And he says in there, man might be described fairly adequately if simply as a two-legged paradox. He has never become accustomed to the tragic miracle of consciousness. Perhaps, as been suggested, his species has not set, has not jailed, but is still in a state of becoming bound by his physical memories to a past of struggle and survival, and limited in his futures by the uneasiness of thought and consciousness. And that, of course, is the paradox, isn't it? We are very good at predicting things, we are very good at remembering things, but we are finding it very difficult to be in the now. And yet, of course, we need to find out what is going on in our brains as we do this. Here's a man being trepanned, as in the famous painting by Hieronymus Bosch. The neurosurgeons that I'll show you later that I work with are not quite the same, although they've kept the hip headgear. Um, <laughs> we tend to put people in scanners. Most of you will have been in one of those. This is an MRI scanner. When you do that, you can see what is inside. The physicality of the human brain is very clear. And yet, of course, these 15 brains, I guess nobody will be able to tell me which of those are men and which are women and which of them is a famous BBC TV presenter who was not particularly happy being in my scanner. And of course, you can then start to look at how the brain develops, and you can even put more people in the scanner, um, which is, of course, very exciting. But what is it then that we see? Here's an artwork by my friend Annie Cattrall, who's taken a photo of her niece, of herself, and of her mother. And of course, the iris is the only part of the brain that we can see with the naked eye. And what we see then becomes a real kind of interesting question. Most of you will just see black blobs up there, black and white. And yet, if I show you this, you cannot help see my two daughters playing in the, in the sun. So what is it about the templates that we make? What is it about having to make meaning of things that we have to have these templates? Are we, in fact, prediction machines? So look at this little baby who's got a cochlear implant, which means that this baby is now able to hear, but what the baby hears is very different. It's like this. Did anybody understand any of that? And yet, if I give you a template, which is what most of us will hear, and not just the eight channels that I played you. The wife helped her husband. It's very difficult not to suddenly hear it, to make sense of the noise. And of course, that's what we do. We tend to experience the world. Here's a, a, a revolving brain, and most people in Oxford, when they see this, they say, ah, yes, Morton, you are Danish. Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him so well. <laughs> And of course, I am Danish, I can't run away from that. And what I'm showing is a form of lobology. So as you can see up here, really what you see is if I was sort of facing you this way, this is the back of my brain, this is the front of the brain, this is if I was lying down, which I hope you won't be doing tonight, and this is if I'm looking at front of you. And in red, you get the visual cortex. So in other words, things come in through the retina, and then it basically comes to the back of the brain. And then in dark blue, you've got the sense of, of 
of hearing, and in light blue, the sense of being touched, and then in orange and yellow, what it's like to smell and taste things. But of course, the key things about any kind of map is really where they are the white spots. On the old maps, they wrote, here be dragons. And of course, that's where we really want to go. But before we went there, Annie had the great idea of actually making a set of sculptures of this. So if you go across to the Welcome Museum, you can actually see one of the first neural portraits of what it's like to really experience the world. Except, of course, the one thing we don't show you here is, why does it have to mean anything? We're just showing you the five senses are in the brain. And, you know, we were fairly successful, but of course it was neurophenology. The idea that we just have blobs. This is a fairly good portrait of myself from the 17th century, where I'm sort of showing you exactly where the different blobs are on the brain. But of course, that's not how the brain works. The brain is a very complex network. In fact, borrowing a quote from Thomas Aquinas, quid quid recipitor al modum representis recipitor, which basically means that the contents is shaped by the container. And so in my work, I can basically work out what the wiring is in your brains using these MRIs, and I can look at how traffic is flowing on that wiring, and then I can make a computer model that can basically give me the same kind of result. And then, of course, once I have a computer model, I can start to take it apart, and I can find out what are the important, the necessary and sufficient components that are necessary. So it becomes something more than neurophenology. And I do this with this wonderful man from Barcelona, Gustavo Deco. Everybody should have a friend in Barcelona. It means you can go there on a regular basis. That really is a pleasure. But of course, I, when I talk about pleasure, I'm not talking about hedonism. It's not just the pursuit of pleasure, it's something else. Because of course, when it comes to pleasure, there's a cycle. Unfortunately, I, as I flew in, I had to content myself with some pretty not so good coffee. And at the moment, I'm in a wanting phase. I really, really would quite like to try some very good coffee. So I'm sort of in this kind of phase. I'm foraging for good coffee, and there may be some here. And once I have engaged with that, I then start liking it. And at some point, there will be great moments of pleasure during this process. And at some point, I can start thinking about science again. So pleasure really is what enables those phase transitions. So it's absolutely important. Now, I've done a lot of neurophrenology in my time. I've put lots of people in scanners, doing all kinds of things, eating things, uh, having social interactions, even taking methamphetamines. It was, surprising. It was before crystal meth, it was before Breaking Bad. Um, <laughs> and it was surprisingly easy to get the, uh, the ethics for that. And what you find when you do this is that, of course, you get pleasure the first time you take it. So this is, in fact, the whole pleasure network being active. We also were able to get ethics to do gambling which, of course, is also one of the great vice and pleasures of many people. But the one thing we couldn't do was sex. So I had to ally myself with a Dutch person, Janneke Georgiatis, who sort of is the master and Johnson's role into one person. And he looked into this very important question, namely, what happens in the brains of women when they fake orgasms compared to when they have real orgasms? Now, there's a real conundrum here, because we know from sex lies and videotapes, in other words, questionnaires, that only about 30% of women will have sex on a regular basis. I don't think many men would stand for the same thing, but the key thing really is to think about what happens in the brain. And as you can see up here, when you fake an orgasm, there's only a little bit of motor activity, but very little in the white spots in where the pleasure network is. On the other hand, when you have a real orgasm, you actually get that whole circuit. And you can say it's a bit frivolous to talk about sex um, on, a, on a rainful day in London. But of course it is. I am Scandinavian after all, right? So although not Dutch, but really what the reason why I want you to show these things is because you can see how you have different networks switching in and out. And one of the things that happen when you have affective disorders, when you have anhedonia, the lack of pleasure, is that you can't make that transition. You end up being addicted to things. You spend all your time here and there's very little pleasure and you go over that cycle quickly over and over again or you can't really get to those things. So the key thing here really is to think about how it is that there's almost like a choreography, a dance of how different brain regions are talking to each other as we go through this cycle. And that, of course, that traffic, that can be jammed, that can be closures of the roads, and trying to think about how we can unlock those, unblock those, is really how we can give people more pleasure. Now, you can do things to rats that you can't do to humans. You can take things out, and you can find out that there's a network of hedonic hotspots that if you stimulate here, in the ventral pallidum or in the nucleus accumbens, the rat will lick its lips more to sugar water, which is how you measure pleasure in, in, other, in other animals like rats. And you have a very similar kind of network in humans. And so really thinking about pleasure, 
before we start thinking about well-being, is thinking about how the starts of different regions go together. And there are many ways that one can change those. One of them is my good friend and colleague, Thibu Assis, who's talking to somebody who uh, was very impressed with his work. Um, <laughs> because what he was able to do was, was to stick an electrode into a girl with dystonia, which is a terrible motor disease. Um, that basically means that she's completely normal, but she's just unable to put her hands out and hold them in front of her. Now, if you drill a hole into her brain and rebalance the network in a part called the globus pallidus internal segment on both sides and put a battery onto the chest like a pacemaker, you can basically transform this girl's life. She, if you met her today, she would be exactly like a normal girl because this is what happens. Now, she also has to undergo a lot of physiotherapy in order to end up like this. And you'll see in a moment, and she's such a wonderful woman, um, you can see how her left arm here at this point hadn't quite recovered from the, the toll of having this, this problem. So this is quite exciting that we can do this, that we now have such a good understanding that we can rebalance these networks. We can even do it for things that you can't see. If you were to be amputated, about 25% of those who get amputated get chronic phantom limb pains, and that's really quite awful. Earlier, people thought they could just amputate more, but then you just get a larger phantom. If you give people morphine, it works for about two months, and you're left with the constipation. Um, but if you, on the other hand, stimulate deep in the brain, in the periodontal gray, at 20 hertz, you can make that pain go away. You can have pleasure. And as it happens, when you scan people while they're doing that, you get activity in the pleasure circuit, not surprisingly. Now, if you stimulate at 90 hertz, the pain becomes unbearable. So in other words, it's the same circuit that subserves pain and pleasure. And when Annie heard that, she said, we've got to make another sculpture. So here's another sculpture instantiating what pain and pleasure really is in the brain. Now, how am I doing on time, sir? You've got um, four minutes if you can do it all. Ooh, I can do something better, I think. Let's talk about music. So when I, when I, talk, when I tell my students about this, they look up and say, who's that black guy? That's not Obama, is it? Steven Pinker famously said that music was like auditory cheesecake. It could vanish and the species would be unchanged. I think he's completely wrong. And I think James Brown will show you why. So why is that so... Great, right? Don't be German on me. Don't do that, pardon. <laughs> um, look at the figure and vase behind me. You can either see the vase or you can see the two faces. You can either hear the rhythm or you can hear the guitar going ta ka ta ka ka ta 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 ka ta ka ka ta And it's all about prediction error. It's all about having a template and matching that template. So we took the classic funk beats. Um, and here, hopefully, there will be a simple one where we just tried something like this. It's not particularly danceable, right? Maybe with a handbag. <laughs> it's too predictable, right? I mean, it's not, that, it's not that funky. But what if we add a little bit of spice, a little bit of syncopation to get us going? There's a, not quite James Brown. There's not the, yeah! <laughs> but you can tell how, because it's a little bit more unpredictable, it's more interesting. And so we like it. We like to move. We like to, it. What if we add a lot of complexity to it. It's like crouch, celebrating a goal, right? I mean, it's too unpredictable. So we were interested in this. We asked people, and it becomes an inverted U-shape. The kind of things that are too predictable are the things that you basically don't particularly want and don't particularly like by the things that are just at the right kind of level of predictability is what you like. And so we couldn't help ourselves make one of these models that I alluded to. We make a model and try to see what are the components that are important. It turns out that when you are in the groove, you are meter stable, which is a term from dynamical systems. And you can measure this very precisely. And when you then look at what regions are responsible for that, you get what I call the eudaimonia of groove. Namely, you get the pleasure circuit, which is the frontal pit of the brain, but also parts in the back. So a whole network that subserves the meaningfulness of music the reason why you want to make dance. And of course, we have to go back to Aristotle because that's exactly what he said. He said, let there be James Brown. No, that's not what he said. He said, <laughs> hedonia and eudaimonia is basically what happiness is all about. 
And the lack of pleasure, of course, anhedonia is one of the key components of most mental illnesses. So I'm betting on that we could help learn about happiness by understanding pleasure, but it's not going to be enough. We've got to understand about eudaimonia, and music is a good thing. And not only music, because together with Robin Carthart Harris, we've been very interested in psilocybin and various other drugs, which are incredibly meaningful for reasons we don't understand. But for instance, it's one of the things that can break this cycle. About 60 to 70 percent of patients that try psilocybin together to quit their nicotine addiction will actually go through it. But at the end of the day, though, it's not about psilocybin, magic mushrooms. It could be about music. It's certainly not about deep brain electrodes. It's about being with other people. Here's my good friend, Roman Kasnarik, who, taught, who has written a book on empathy. And together, we've made this museum called the Empathy Museum. If you haven't seen it, you should go. And then you should come next time we do one of our pop-up things. And then you might be able to go and walk in the blue shoes of a crazy professor and listen to the stories that we tell ourselves, or in the high heels of, a, of somebody who works in a different kind of life. So I think there's a lot to be done. Um, I think the key thing, though, and I'm very happy when Vince told me that he is going to do something on poetry, because, of course, poetry is perhaps one of those things that really gives us meaning, that really gives us a sense of, of joy. And Derek Walcott, sadly, is no longer with them, but he said, for every poet... It is always morning in the world. History a forgotten insomniac night. History and elemental awe are always our early beginning because the fate of poetry is to fall in love with the world in spite of history. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for having me, Vince and everybody. Um, so we all know that our um, happy mind makes a happy uh, body. So I would like to speak about how I think we can make ourselves happy, and that is through dance. So I dance, and I think everybody should dance. It's a physical exercise. It makes our body healthy. It's relating to uh, immune-boosting effects and to health in general. And it gives us the right kind of pleasure, as we just heard from Morton. So... It's just so good for us. But then many of you are going to tell me, as it has happened throughout my PhD, people say, I can't dance and I don't want to dance. <laughs> and so what about watching dance then, I ask? Well, we can, you know, go to the theater, we can stay on the sofa and watch dance, uh, even just on the YouTube channel. So I spent a lot of my PhD and my postdoctoral work at the University of the Balearic Islands and City University London in asking the question, what do I get out of watching dance? So watching dance in the lab, basically what I do is I invite a lot of people who don't dance and I have them watch little short video clips of dance um, in the lab while I record two things from them. They're answers, what they think they see, what they feel, so subjective reports, ratings, and their physiology. And that's because we know that when we feel an emotion, our body reacts as well, and we have electrodes to measure this. So we will attach little electrodes to people's fingers, and we, I can measure if people are actually feeling an emotion um, as well. And then I have them watch ballet, for example. So I would like to share three pieces of evidence with you today about this work. Um, first, the question we were asking ourselves, is there emotion in a dance movement or is it just pretty or something? So we found something quite surprising for us. There are some specific shapes that just make us happy for some reason. So these were round shapes. So I'm going to show you here. Um, what we showed participants were just these videos I was talking about. And some of these videos were mostly rounded movements, so all round. And other movements were more like edgy. And the majority of people felt really happy when they saw the round movements, while not really happy when they saw the edgy ones. So that's important. And if we look at the entire art history, for example, a lot of depictions of dance movements were actually such that depicted round movement, like back bends or round of the arms and so on, and that across cultures and across times. 
Another thing that struck us, struck us that, that really doesn't make dance, uh, dancers happy is that extreme movements are happy, uh, making people happy. So, for example, I'm showing you four pictures here of someone like stretching their leg very high up, and we found that people were more happy when they saw a very extreme type of movements. Interesting as well. So again, we went to the Archaeological History Museum and just checked, and again, a lot of the representations were these extreme kinds of stretches. Okay, let's try. I would like to show you some of the videos and see if the same happens for you. So I brought two videos. One is from a sad ballet, and one is from a happy ballet. And I'm going to play them one after the other, and then I'm going to ask you which one you thought was happy and which one was sad. So let's have a look at this one first. Don't say anything. Don't give it away. And then the other one. So who thinks that this last one was happy? The majority <laughs> like it, our study. <laughs> so just to look again, you can see the roundedness and the edginess. So something so simple is just about making people happy with the right moves. Second question, let's move on, Christian, quickly. So um, obviously when we watch a dance, it's not just about what we see, it's also about what we hear. I didn't bring music. Morton showed the effect it had on all of us, so we know that now. But we tried to investigate that also in the lab, and we combined sad and happy music with sad and happy dance. So we had people watch all these video clips while they were listening sometimes to music that was congruent with what they were seeing, and sometimes it was incongruent with what they were seeing. And we found that the music and the dance had a super additive effect. So if the music and the dance matched, not only did people find the emotions more stronger, that they felt, but also their bodies reacted much more strongly. So there's something about the music and the dance that shares something that makes us actually feel something very strongly, and that makes a big point for the sofa version of the dance watching, of course. But then this happened, which was basically <laughs> dancing is good for the ed. And uh, where this came from was from a study showing where we were looking at dancers and lay people because we really were interested in, does it make a difference if I have training in dance for my experience of a dance? So we compared dancers and non-dancers when they were watching these ballet movements. And we recorded again their body responses as well as their subjective reports. And what we found was it did make a difference. Not only did the dancers rate the emotions more strongly, but also their bodies were more sensitive to the different movements and different emotions expressed with the movements. So maybe there's something beyond the sofa anyway. Um, I would like to finish with a happy outlook, which is just summing up what we found so far. Very simple, that there are some uh, movements that just make us more happy than others. So if you want to be happy, go out and find the right moves. Um, <laughs> watching dance, just watching dance makes us sweat. So we found that, and in that endeavor, um, dance and music have a super additive effect, so uh, try to find the right moves with the right sound. So is watching dance as good as uh, doing dance. Well, I guess there's still some important research to do here, but at least remember the expertise effects, there seems to be something about it. So, just as a final reflection, so we all have an intuition about music being a tool for us that we can use to enhance our mood, but maybe we should give dance a chance too. So, therefore, I have a task for you tonight before bed. Go to your browser, Google, for example, dance class, plenty to choose from. <laughs> Or Google tickets for dance performance. Please do it. <laughs> You'll feel very happy. Thank you to everybody. <laughs>
inventing parts of Western philosophy. He also came up with a great word that's very helpful um, to introduce this topic, which is eudaimonia. And essentially what this means is that life can be worth living and that we should be aiming towards living a life that's worth living. And we still use this word today to differentiate two different types of happiness. Eudaimonic happiness, which is basically our satisfaction with life. You know, we could describe it as trying to measure human flourishing, but really just asking people to reflect on their life and to tell us how satisfied, how happy they feel. And in contrast, we have hedonic pleasure, you know, immediate feelings of satiation or happiness or pleasure. So I think so far this evening, we've talked a lot about joy and pleasure in the moment, and we haven't talked much about satisfaction, about our feelings of happiness with ourselves and our lives. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. So the way that we try and measure this in people is mostly in surveys. So the kinds of questions that we might ask people is things like, do you agree or disagree with, in most ways, my life is close to the ideal? So far, I've gotten the important things out of life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. And because there's quite a lot of people interested in happiness, from governments to NGOs to academics, you're actually able to ask quite a lot of people these questions. So there's something called the World Value Survey that actually measures hundreds of thousands of people all over the world over time and asks them these kinds of questions, as well as you know, many, many other surveys and measures we've got. So everything I'm going to talk to you about this evening is based on these very large samples of people being asked these questions about, about how satisfied they feel with their lives. So one of the questions that I'm going to try and answer first is about who is happiest. So who in these hundreds of thousands of people reports being most satisfied with their lives? And maybe we can get some lessons there about what kinds of people are happier. Now, before I, I go into this, I do think there's an important caveat to make. So when anyone, whenever anyone is trying to convince you with survey evidence, I want you to think about this graph. This graph is a correlation between per capita cheese consumption and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Now, the point I'm making is that some of the evidence I'm showing you is just a correlation. It's just saying, like, hey, people who are like this report being happiest. It doesn't mean that because they are like that, that caused them to be happy. It just means that it's a correlation. Okay? Um, so I'm going to start off, and we're going to talk about age. So when we tell teenagers that, uh, that this is the best time of their life, that um, it's amazing to be young and to be a student and to have no responsibilities, that's kind of true, um, because it seems like they're certainly happier than people for most of their adult life. But actually, the really old people, they're much happier. Um, so there is this very well-known U-shaped curve in happiness. And this has been shown in across samples, across people, you know, in, in these vast numbers of people that we ask. This is the pattern we see in age. And to be honest, we're not exactly sure why this is. Probably one of the most prevalent uh, explanations is that it's really about expectations. So as we get older, we have these expectations about what life should be like, and then, unfortunately, we constantly feel like we don't actually, our lives don't meet those expectations. So as we get older, the kind of gap between these expectations becomes more realized, and so then people report being less satisfied with their life. And then as we get older, we kind of adjust our expectations, and that's why people, when they get you know, more, uh, more elderly, that they get happier. And this isn't just shown through surveys. Um, this is the rate of antidepressant use across age. So again, we see the opposite direction because this is antidepressants. Um, and you can even see this evidence in monkeys. So um, some researchers went and asked all the zookeepers, um, or many of the zookeepers across the world, and asked them, how happy do your monkeys seem? Um, 
which is, must be kind of an old, old question to get. Now, the zookeepers had no idea what the study was about. They weren't told why they were being asked this. But then the researchers were able to look at the age of these primates and then the reported kind of uh, happiness of these primates. And again, the same U-shaped curve arises. Um, what's interesting is that it depends on the kind of questions you ask. So you can kind of see that in general, life satisfaction questions, you see the same kind of shape. Is my life worthwhile? Do you see kind of a very similar shape? General, how happy are you? You see a general shape. But actually, you see the anxiety levels are much higher in midlife. So this is an alternative explanation for why this is. That basically, life becomes more stressful in midlife. Maybe we have more responsibilities placed on us. Maybe, you know, you've got parents to look after, children to look after, and that anxiety could also be an explanation. Another um, kind of group that does seem happiest is people who report being satisfied with their relationships. So that's both romantic relationships, but also in terms of people who have lots of friends, who spend lots of time with their friends. This is one of the biggest like, predictors of who is happy and who's not, basically your personal relationships. So you can see here that people who say that they're satisfied with their relationships report being much happier than people who report not being satisfied. Now, another one is money. And money gets people really interested about happiness. Because in many ways, we don't really like to think that money leads to happiness. You know, we have this idea that, oh, you can't buy happiness. You know, happiness comes from within. I still don't really understand where that idea came from. Because to me, like, <laughs> if you look across countries, rich countries are happier than poor countries. Quite straightforward. Within countries, if you're poor within a country, then you're less happy than if you're rich within a country. So at least cross-sectionally, as in if you measure it at one point of time, money does lead to happiness, especially at the low end. So especially for those people who earn little amounts of money, even very small increases can dramatically improve people's well-being. But it's not just about having money. There's also increasing evidence about how you use your money impacts your happiness. So if people use their limited budget, which we all have a limited amount to spend, if we spend more of it on experiences and not stuff, then people seem to be happier from those experiences. Uh, if we spend more money on others rather than just buying stuff for ourselves, we seem to be happier as well. So even though we can't kind of wave a, wave a magic wand and become richer, maybe we can allocate our spending differently to try and improve our happiness as well. Another one is fulfilling employment, that if people feel in control of their lives, if they feel that they're doing something they're good at, that's another super strong predictor of who is happy and who's not. Now, I think I know what you're all thinking now. I think what you're thinking is, this is just too easy. Like, all you're telling me is, I need to get really rich, I need to have amazing relationships, both romantically and otherwise, I need to find a job that I'm like kick ass at and that I find really feeling control and fulfilling. Like, I'm just gonna go home tonight and be much happier. But the thing is that actually it's a bit more complicated than that. And the reason it's more complicated is because of this thing called hedonic adaption. Now, basically, hedonic adaption is not a good or a bad thing, but it changes what it means to try and pursue happiness. If we're trying to become happier, then hedonic adaption can be your enemy. So let me explain. Basically, everything that we do, everything that changes in our lives, we just adapt to. That's what the human condition is. We're supposed to be good at adapting to changing environments. And that's the same with happiness. So even though things that we think might really impact our happiness, we just adjust. So within a few years, no matter kind of what happens to us, we seem to go back to a set point. So if you look about marriage, you think that maybe, like I showed you, that relationships matter. Maybe if we get married, we're going to be much happier. But no. We're happier a bit beforehand. We're really happy on the day. That's awesome. And then pff, back, to, back to normal. No. Marriage, not, not, not really helping. Birth of a child. Um, again, pretty awesome just before. Pretty crappy just afterwards. But again, we just adjust back to the set point. Um, even when really terrible things happen, even when really awful things, like the death of a spouse, we do adjust back within a few years. Um, uh, you can even see that someone's a bit happier at the end um, there, but this depends on gender and depends on a few other things. But basically, um, 
we just adapt to what happens to us. Now, this has really important implications for us pursuing happiness. Because if we're trying to pursue happiness, but then we know that we adapt every time, then we need to think about how big the changes are that are happening in our lives. If we win the lottery tomorrow, but then we adapt to that, and in a couple of years' time, we're back to normal levels of happiness, then we can't really win the lottery twice. You know? uh, so really, it's about steady changes, steady gains. People will be much happier if they slowly increase their income over time than if they had some massive windfall. And similarly with other areas of life, slow goal fulfillment that feels like you're making progress is going to make people happier than big changes. And similarly, if you think about things like if someone was to become disabled versus a chronic illness, all the evidence shows that for many disabilities that are kind of one-off instances, people do adjust. But for chronic illnesses where we feel bad continuously over time, we don't adjust to that. So thinking about what kinds of things might change our levels of well-being and trying to avoid certain things more than others would also be a way for people to try and improve their level of happiness. So I want to kind of summarize um, and finish off this evening by just a piece of advice, which is basically that we need to relax a bit more because really, in many ways, we can't fully like, pursue happiness because we'll just adjust back to it. And even if though, like, the worst things that you're really worried about happening to you, you'll adjust to those so they won't affect you as much as you think. Similarly, the things that you think will really make you happy, you'll adjust to that too, so that's not going to make you as happy as you think. So basically, live a nice life, Try and make, improve some things by maybe changing how you spend money, trying to make small goals rather than big changes. But at the same time, almost anything that happens to you, we will adjust back to. So thanks very much. <laughs>